Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Two for One, the Retrospective Pretest Method for Evaluating Training. I'm your host, Miranda Lee, here at uh, the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. And joining me today is Lori Wingate, who's the Director of Evaluate, which is the Evaluation Resource Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. I'd like to just take a moment before we get started to tell you that the views that are expressed in today's webinar are not necessarily the views of the National Science Foundation or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. With us behind the scenes today are Mike Lisecki, Janet Pinhorn, and Tim Suchomsky from Maytech Networks at Maricopa Community Colleges. They're going to help us make sure everything runs smoothly. And we'd also like to thank Emma Perk from Evaluate for helping to set the webinar up. Materials that support today's webinar include our presentation slides, a handout of the key points, and a recording of the webinar. The recording will be posted within about one to two days, and we'll email you the link when it's available. The handout and slides are already up on our website. So today, we're going to show you how to develop and implement the retrospective pretest questions, how to analyze data, and how to use the information that you get from these questions in your work. Throughout the webinar, we're going to have little question and answer breaks. That's when we'll take time to answer the questions that you type in the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. And you can do that at any time. If you have a question for a specific presenter, just let me know. So when those question and answer breaks come up, I can make sure that I address the questions to the right person. Throughout our webinar today, we're going to be revisiting this little roadmap that will just show us where we are and the progress that we're making. So as you see that, you'll get a sense of where we're at in the webinar content. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Lori Wingate, who will talk about an overview of the retrospective pre-test uh, questions. Well, thank you, Miranda, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we had a, a small uh, issue there in the introductions. We um, forgot, I'm so sorry, to forgot to mention one of our presenters, Goldie McDonald, who is a health scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I've worked a lot with Goldie um, over the past few years, and we worked on this method together. So you're going to get to hear from her uh, periodically throughout the webinar. And then, again, she will um, present her experience with this uh, method towards the end of the webinar. So in this first part of the webinar, I'm going to provide an overview of what the retrospective pretest method is, how you would use it in an evaluation, and why you might want to use it. But first, I just have one more housekeeping kind of item before we get into our content. So as you know, um, this is a free webinar. But uh, have you ever gone to a museum or a performance of some sort that was advertised as free, and when you get there, there's actually a little suggested donation in a box sitting out. Well, this webinar is a little bit like that. So we're not going to ask you for money. Um, we're just asking you for a couple minutes of your time at the end of the webinar to complete a, a very short feedback survey at the end of this webinar. It's going to take you less than five minutes, I promise. So um, before we proceed, I'd like you to take a moment to express your intent as to whether you think you can uh, help us out by completing this survey at the, at the end of the webinar. The um, poll is in the upper right corner of, you, of your screen, and you can see a range of options there for you to select to express your intent with regard to this webinar. Your feedback is so important for our evaluation, uh, for us to be accountable to the National Science Foundation, which makes it possible to, for us to bring these webinars to you, and to help us learn how to improve most importantly. Um, looks like most of you are going to do it. That is wonderful. I dare say 100% of you who are answering are going to do that survey for us. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so first of all, I want to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. Um, so we're going to go over the basics of what the retrospective pretest method is. Basically, in a retrospective pretest, respondents rate themselves on some dimension of interest both before and after an intervention. But they give those ratings simultaneously, so in a single data collection event. And just as a heads up, I'm going to use this term intervention to refer to um, any plan. There's a great definition here, any planned effort that is designed to bring about changes in people. So I'm going to show you what a typical retrospective pretest question might look like. 
And there's lots of ways to format this kind of question, and we're going to get into that later. Right now, I just want to show you the basic anatomy of the retrospective pretest question. So here we have the question prompt, so the respondent knows what they're being asked to do. And here they are um, being asked to rate their knowledge, but it could be uh, pretty much anything you want to measure. And then the next thing here that I've highlighted, we have the aspect of the respondent's knowledge, skill, attitude, behavior, whatever it is that we need to measure to assess the quality or the outcomes of our intervention. So in this example, um, we're asking about knowledge of how to format a retrospective pretest question. What a coincidence, right? So there, here we have distinct headers and response areas so that respondents know they are to provide two different answers, one to indicate their current status and one to indicate their prior status. And here we have the rating scale. So in this example, we're using poor to excellent. Um, but it could be any sort of rating scale, even just a yes or no uh, response. So that's the basic setup of this type of question. Uh, just before the Thanksgiving holiday, I asked, uh, I emailed everyone who is registered at that time for this webinar to see if they had examples that they'd be willing to share. And I was really pleased to get uh, several responses, and I'm going to share five of them with you. This first one is from Jessica Kraut from the CDC. As you can see here, she's asking about a person's ability to access climate change projections related to their health departments. And she's doing so both before and after. Uh, she's asking for their ability both before and after their involvement with the CDC program called BRACE, which stands for Building Resilience Against Climate Effects. And I really like this additional question, which they have, where respondents are asked to identify um, other sources that may have contributed to their increased inability. And that's really going to help them with attribution or linking the observed change to the intervention. And that's especially an issue, of course, with longer term interventions when participants might have opportunities to be exposed to or seek out information about the, the intervention's content from other sources. This example is from Sharon Gusky, who has a National Science Foundation funded project at Northwestern Q uh, Connecticut Community College. And these two items are about faculty members' knowledge and ability related to metacognition. And her rating scale goes from very weak to very strong. This one's from Cheryl Eschbach, who's at Michigan State University Extension. But she actually used this when she was at Oregon State University. And it's called the Parenting Skills Ladder. And I'll zoom in so you can actually see some of those questions. Basically, parent participants are asked to rate themselves on several topics um, after and before taking a parenting class. And they rate themselves on a, this, uh, it's actually a seven point scale, zero to six from low to high. And this example is from Mark Dempsey at the Convergence Technology Center at Collin County Community College. Um, and they're asking uh, respondents to rate their level of expertise uh, before and after a, a training. And what's interesting about this one is that they've um, phrased it generically. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, you can see um, instead of naming a specific content area, they've asked. They're highlighting, asking about this track's topic. So it's very adaptable and could be used for a variety of uh, types of training activities. This final example is from uh, Marilyn Barger and Marie Boyette from Florida Advanced Technological Education uh, Center at Hillsborough Community College. And this survey is completed by students uh, who tour an advanced manufacturing facility. This one's a little bit different than the others we've seen, because instead of having a series of pre and post questions, they have two of them embedded here in a series of questions about an array of things. And as you can see, uh, question two here is asking if the student was considering a career in advanced manufacturing before the tour. And question eight asks them if they're considering one now or after the tour. This one's also different than the others we've seen because it just has that yes, no um, response option, which is going to make the analysis quite very straightforward. So there's five uh, examples for you. And I know many of you, there's, gosh, 270 people on at this point. Many of you are using this method. So I'd like you to use the chat box, which is in the lower right uh, corner of your screen, to just give us a brief description of the type of intervention that you're evaluating uh, using this method or that you're thinking of using this method for. And while you're uh, typing in the chat box, I'd like to thank 
um, the contributors of those examples, Jessica, Sharon, Cheryl, Mark, Marie, and Marilyn, for sharing, letting us uh, highlight their work today and show us some real world, the real world aspect of all of this. So I see some examples of student interest in STEM, um, a lot of examples of training and professional development. It's very useful for that. Another example from training abilities, I mean, excuse me, parenting abilities. Um, these are flying by so fast. But quite a range of examples. Uh, Nancy's saying summer K-12 STEM camps. Um, Janelle and many others are talking about teacher professional development. I see, oh, Ibun, hello, Ibun. It uses it for disease surveillance and response training. So you guys, as I'm talking, you can see the huge range of programs this is being used to evaluate. It's pretty astounding. I knew there would be a lot of examples, but that is really amazing. So I personally have used it to evaluate webinars like this one as well as half-day and full-day workshops on evaluation. And with Goldie, I'm gonna, I've been using it to evaluate multi-day trainings on various aspects um, of, of training for uh, overseas CDC personnel. And she's going to be, Goldie will share more of her experience using it in CDC context and evaluation training context a little bit later. So now that everyone knows what this retrospective method is or what these questions look like, how does it figure in as a method in program evaluation? Well, it's really one part of an evaluation, overall evaluation of training or professional development or any kind of effort that's intended to improve what people know, think, or do. So in a comprehensive evaluation of an intervention of that sort, you would want to determine the extent to which that uh, and the intended audience was reached and engaged. And how participants react to the intervention, especially the degree to which they're satisfied, they feel engaged, and they feel that the content is relevant to them and their needs. You would also determine the extent to which the participants inquired uh, what you were trying to impart with them, changes in knowledge, changes in what they're able to do or what they think or what they value. And finally, uh, not finally, but <laughs> the extent to which participants apply what they learn. So do they take the concepts, strategies, ideas from whatever this intervention was offering and use it in their personal life or their work life? And then finally, uh, you would determine the intervention's outcomes and the extent to which it contributed to bringing about the desired changes. So those of you who are involved in training or the evaluation of training probably recognize those levels one through four as the Kirkpatrick model for evaluating training. And if you're not familiar with this approach, I definitely encourage you to learn more. It's just a really useful framework. And I added that level zero here um, because for me, it's really important to know um, about the extent to which I, I was able to reach my intended audience and engage them. And I think that's important for almost uh, in whatever you're doing. Are you reaching the people who need the, the service? So I've just tacked it on there and calling it level zero. Those of you who aren't already familiar with Kirkpatrick may be more familiar with the idea of logic models. And logic models and the Kirkpatrick framework play really nicely together. Um, basically, a logic model, as I'm sure many of you know, but maybe not everybody, it's a graphical depiction of what an intervention is expected, how it's expected to work, um, from the inputs or the resources that make it po that make work possible, the activities or what it's it's actually doing, its outputs or the tangible products it creates, and then we and then its outcomes, typically presented but not always, from ranging from short to mid to long term outcomes. The takeaway here. Um, is the, the logic model and the Kirkpatrick are both really good ways to uh, think about an overall approach to evaluating training, and then we'll, we'll look at how this method fits in in particular. Um, as I talk about, these two frameworks work really well together. So mapping Kirkpatrick onto a logic model, we might look at uh, we would look at reach and reaction at the in terms of what the intervention is doing and what is it creating um, for short-term outcomes. We might look at learning, um, midterm outcomes, behavior change, and then those long-term outcomes. It doesn't always map this way perfectly, but this is where I tend to start when I'm thinking about evaluating a kind of intervention like this. 
So the re retrospective pretest method is really best suited to measuring changes in learning and behavior, um, what, or what typically may be framed as short or midterm outcomes. And the dimensions of learning, kind of what we're including under this umbrella term of learning, may include changes in skills and knowledge, attitudes, motivation, self-efficacy. Uh, as for change in behavior, we would be looking for the application of that content as I as I, of the intervention, as I mentioned before, or changes in practice spurred by the intervention. In case you're not familiar with this term, self-efficacy, um, it basically just refers to someone's belief in their ability, in his or her ability to do something. And some of the research on this method suggests that this approach is really uh, especially good for measuring changes in self-efficacy. So you might want to think about that as you're considering ways you might use this method. So it's really a useful method, but it is just one piece of an overall evaluation of an intervention. So you do want to keep that in mind. Um, and this type of data should be collected in conjunction with other data from participants in an intervention. And I'll show you how that plays out in my work. So here's an image of a feedback survey that I used in a recent workshop. And no, you do not have to read the actual questions on there. Um, so first, we ask for some basic demographic questions that are going to help us interpret the results. In this case, we're just looking at the person's role in the National Science Foundation program in which we're involved. Um, and then we just have a few questions about um, the person's satisfaction, their engagement, the perceived relevance, their intent to use the workshop content. Those, those map well, those questions map really well onto the Kirkpatrick framework. Then we have our retrospective pretest questions, which we align with our workshop objectives. And finally, we ask two open-ended questions about what aspects of the workshop needed improvement and which were especially good. And to find out if participants actually applied the workshop content on the job, um, we also will gather additional qualitative and quantitative data in a few months. So now we're on the same page about what this method is and how it fits into a larger evaluation. So why might we want to use it? Well, first and foremost, it reduces or eliminates response shift bias, which is really just a fancy name for I didn't know what I didn't know. And I'll demonstrate what I mean here. In a traditional pretest, you're asked to answer a set of questions before a workshop starts, right? So in this example, I'm just imagining a workshop on how to use Excel. So if I was presented with this question um, before I got any of the workshop's content, I might think, yeah, I know my way around Excel pretty well. I know all the basic formulas. I can make pretty cool bar charts. So I would rate myself as moderately skilled. But if I was in the workshop that Miranda led at the recent American Evaluation Association conference, and she was covering things like that I never even heard of, like conditional formatting, icon arrays, slicers, name managers, um, I would realize pretty soon after the workshop started that I really wasn't quite as skilled uh, as I thought I was in Excel. So in a, tip, in a traditional uh, pre-post test, the intervention, some time would pass, and I would ex have the experience. And then I would be presented with the same questions and asked to rate myself again. But now I know a lot of cool stuff in Excel that I never knew about before. Um, I also realize I have more to learn. So I'm going to rate myself moderately skilled again. So much to the trainers and, and the evaluators' chagrin, it looks like I didn't learn anything when, in fact, I learned a lot. And this is well documented in the research on this method. It's so basically, this is response shift bias. So my frame of reference for answering the question has changed. So in a retrospe pre retrospective pretest, I get both items at the same time, as we've already talked about. And in this example, I would rate myself um, as moderately skilled at the end of the workshop. And before the workshop, I realize now I was only somewhat skilled. But there's other reasons that it's a desirable method. Um, it's really convenient. So you only have to take time once during a training or whatever intervention to gather the data. You get both the pre and the post test data at the same time. So two for one, basically, two sets of data for the effort of one. And it also means that missing data isn't really an issue. So unless people uh, skip questions, you're going to have a complete set of pre and post data, which saves you a lot of hassle. It also makes anonymity either, since you don't have to two match match two um, anonymous surveys. Um, 
it's also more accurate than traditional pre-post tests when it comes to self-assessment, mainly because of that response shift bias problem with traditional pre-post tests. And again, there's been a lot of research on this, and most studies show that the retrospective pre-tests are more accurate than traditional pre-tests. And that's been studied in multiple ways, including comparing uh, self-ratings to objective measures, such as observation um, and testing. And there, um, if you want to know more about this, there's a, in our handout that Miranda mentioned, we have a, a link to a summary of the research um, on this method. And I would encourage you to check that out. It's also really versatile. It's been used in, as you guys saw in your chat, oh my gosh, so many different contexts. It's been used and researched in so many different settings. Um, I will say, though, I didn't come across anything in the reading that I did that talked about how it holds up cross-culturally. So that may be an issue here. And you definitely want to be aware of that if you're working in, in different settings. Um, and then finally, uh, from my personal experience, I've just it tends to be more acceptable to adult learners. It's a really different experience to take a test um, versus rate yourself. And so this, this sort of self-assessment feels much more about evaluating the intervention than uh, having my individual performance be judged. So those are some of the benefits. And I'd like to know from you um, what you think some of the drawbacks are to using this method or what your concerns um, are about using it. And I know the chat box is going to fill up. I probably won't even be able to keep up with it. But I've anticipated one concern, and that would be for um, some of you of funding from the National Science Foundation, you might be wondering how it fits into the common guidelines for education research and development. So I think it would be an acceptable method for what the NSF and Institution for Education Sciences called foundational research, um, as well as exploratory research and design and development research. But it wouldn't be acceptable, at least not as the primary method um, for those other levels of impact research, which they call efficacy, effectiveness, and scale-up. So it would definitely be OK to use it, uh, use the method, but not rely on it as a primary means for determining an intervention's impact. So we see, like, of course, um, social desirability is always an issue. And in the research, um, they did look at that especially in some studies and showed that it's no more of an issue in this method versus traditional pre-post methods. Of course, if you're using traditional testing, uh, social desirability isn't, isn't as much of an issue. But it doesn't seem to be more of an issue in this approach as other compared with other self-assessment approaches. Yeah, so Pat is talking about the participant wanting to please or satisfy the presenter and trainer. Again, that is social desirability. I'll tell you a concern that I had was, um, so we tend to ask these questions, we align them with our objectives for, it, for whatever it is that we're doing. And I was worrying about halo effect, that if somebody li really liked the workshop or thought they learned you know, something maybe really important to them, that they would just give across the board high ratings. But when I actually look at our data, our, our data are quite variable. And in what I see is you know, high ratings where I think we did well and lower ratings where I think we didn't do as well. So um, from what I, my personal experience is that um, I'm not seeing that as an issue in terms of like halo effect or social desirability so much. But I think people are answering um, pretty honestly. OK, Stacy pointed out results are often presented as if they come from true pre-post tests. So, um, if she means true pre-post as in terms of like objective testing, that would definitely be a problem. We have to interpret these results, um, keep it sit the language situated in terms of people's, this is how they perceive themselves, this is how they perceive their growth. We can't say this person actually gained you know, X amount of knowledge. Um, but in, in terms of true pre-post, you know, we do the data collection before and the data collection after the, the intervention. Um, the research shows that the, pre, the retrospective method is actually more accurate. So there wouldn't be a problem like trying to, you're not trying to pull anything over on anybody using this method. It's actually more accurate in terms of measuring self-perceptions. OK, well, you guys can keep up with that chat. With uh, 274 people on there, it's difficult to see what everyone's saying, but it's quite amazing. And I hope you guys do pay attention to what everyone is saying. Um, so just in short, it's an imperfect but very useful tool. As you can see from this quote from Theodore Lamb, who wrote an article about this method in the Harvard 
uh, Family Research Project newsletter, and that a link to that is also in our handout. So this was the first um, and longest segment of our webinar. Uh, we're going to we're going to turn it over to Goldie for her comments, and then we're going to have our first question break. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Goldie. Thanks, Lori. Um, I really am thrilled with the participation and that there's 274 people. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them anymore. So if you could just tell Mike that somehow with the increasing numbers, I've been bounced out. But in the meantime, while you guys work on that, I had two comments just for the group to consider, um, a couple points to affirm for our participants um, that I want to make sure you take away from that first section. The first is, that retrospective pretest items do not have to be standalone. You can add them to a pre-existing evaluation form or survey, right? So you don't have to start from ground zero to incorporate uh, this method into your evaluation work. Um, the second kind of overarching issue I just want to make sure is clear to everyone is the idea that these items Speak to overarching issues. Um, so let me say this another way in terms of questions. They don't answer just whether or not there was a change. They help you to understand the degree of that change, how much growth, um, the extent, or whether or not participants reached a certain threshold or have sufficient or basic knowledge or skills or you know, understanding, whatever it is. So I think that as we continue into the next session, the next couple sections, just thinking about those, you know, two overarching points that make this method really accessible and helpful for people. So with that, let me pass it to Miranda for the questions. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Goldie. And um, we have a ton of questions that were entered in the chat box. They're all really great. So I'll start at the beginning. Some of your questions I'll combine and roll up into one question because they were very similar. Uh, so if you don't hear your question exactly asked, um, it was added in with other questions. So the first question, um, I will start with Lori. Um, and it has to do with the order of the before first or now first. Um, which is better? Is there a way to pick one? Is there a logic behind picking one? Sure, sure. Um, so I will admit that when I first started a asking questions this way, I actually put the before first, because that makes sense, right? Before comes first, then after. Um, but then I did come across the research, which, which does put forth a recommendation to put the post item first. And the idea is that so you don't, um, so when the person, I think when we see it, it looks unusual. But if you're a person sitting down to answer the question, and it's asking you, OK, right now, where are you? Where is your level? It makes a lot of sense. So you answer where you are now. Then the, then the prompt is, asks you to think back in time, where were you? So I think from the experience of answering these questions, it is the best way. It is the recommended way. Now, when we present the results, you wouldn't want to present it the reverse because people are going to get super confused. But on the instrument itself, it is recommended to put the post item first. OK, great. Thanks. So the next set of questions deals with any information or data you have on how prevalent response shift bias is. Sure, I can I can try to speak to that. And I meant to say when I started speaking, just to let um, Maytech know that I sent them Goldie's phone number, so hopefully we can get her back on by the time she needs to give her great information towards the end of this webinar. But in terms of the prevalence of response shift bias, um, it um, it seems to be quite an issue uh, with self assessment. You know, like the example I gave with Excel, and there's in the literature there's so many examples. The first one, um, I don't remember the guy's name or gal's name, but the last name is Howard, who did this original research in 1979 and 1980, and the original study was on um, a pro. I think it was with the Air Force on they were studying the program to reduce dogmatism, and uh, and the people, I mean, it's classic of what this response bias is. So 
the, they compare the traditional pre and the traditional post ratings on dogmatism. And people came out of this program looking more dogmatic. And it just was contrary to what the participants were saying you know, in person, what the trainers were observing. And so they really demonstrated that this was a real problem. And then they, they studied this other method and found that it, it, it took that issue away. But I mean, if you look into the, you know, look at the review of the research that we have in our handout, um, just Google it, and, and you'll see that it's, it is quite pervasive. Um, and this is a good remedy for it. OK. Uh, thank you. So the next question is, um, is there, are there, um, I'm sorry, um, how well does this method work with younger uh, respondents, uh, children, teenagers, et cetera? Oh, well, that is an excellent question that I don't know the answer to. So I would say if there's anybody in the audience who knows about that, to put it in the chat box. Um, I didn't read anything about that in particular. I did um, the one example from Marie Boya and Marilyn Barger that we shared was used with high school students. But I can't, you know, I don't really know about any younger than that. And I, you know, it's a really excellent question. I wonder if any research has been done on that. OK. Also, um, the question as uh, is there a risk of respondents systematically underrating pretest abilities to show appreciation for the intervention? Are you aware of any information about that? Well, and I think that falls under the umbrella of social desirability um, bias. You know, you go to a training, you like the trainer, you had a good time, um, you want to support whatever you know whatever it is that brought you there. So that's definitely an issue. It's an issue in any kind of anytime you're rating. You're giving your opinion of something. Um, but I will say in the data that I've seen, it seems like people are pretty honest. Like there's there's some things that, you know, they're going to, uh, they say that what, were pretty good and some things that they say that, that weren't that good. What I think is most valuable is to be able to compare. When you have multiple uh, events, like we have so many of these webinars, we do workshops, it's really useful me to, to be able to compare across those. Because if social desirability is a you know, bias is a problem, it's most likely not going to be a bigger problem in, in one venue than another, although maybe live and in person it could come up. But it's going to be even through across these different events. So I can still compare and, and make meaning out of how, you know, the, did I did do well in, in one of these events versus versus another. Um, but it is, that's an issue, and it's an issue with any kind of ratings or self-assessment for sure. And then the final question before we move on to the next session is, uh, when is this design a better option compared to the classic methods, and when is it not a better design? Well, I will say in general, from my reading, it is always a better design when you're talking about self-assessment. I shouldn't say always. It's, it's usually a better design. Now, if you have the opportunity to use an objective measure, you know, a, a, an actual test of knowledge, that's going to be superior to any kind of self-assessment. And often you want to kind of use more than one method. So I think if you're using self-assessment, it's probably going to be a better way to go to use the retrospective versus the traditional pre-post. OK. Well, so that brings us to the end of our first question and answer break. Um, during the next session, please make sure to continue to ask your questions in the chat box. And I'm going to turn it back over to Lori to uh, tell us about design of the retrospective pretest question. OK, thank you for all the great questions, everyone. Um, as like anything, the more I get into this, the, you know, the more I learn, the more I feel like I, there's so many ways so many more things that we need to find out and so many opportunities to research this method. Um, so in this section, we're going to focus in on designing retrospective pretest questions, including the appropriate focus uh, of these types of questions, the options for scales, and recommendations for formatting them, which we've just touched on briefly already. So the most important thing to do is to focus the questions on the things that really matter. This is the rule of thumb for any kind of data collection, of course. So the knowledge, skills, attitudes, or behaviors among your participants that you're seeking to influence with your intervention. So if your intervention has a logic model, um, it's a good idea to check that to make sure you're really focusing your data collection properly. Um, as I mentioned before, we can look at learning and behavior through this method, which may likely be situated as uh, short-term and, and mid-term outcomes. 
Um, and these are the kinds of things we can investigate. Um, and the important thing here is to, to focus on to focus on individual level changes. So just to give you a, an idea of what these sorts of questions might look like, if we're asking about knowledge, um, the question stem could be something like, rate your knowledge of, or what is your level of expertise? Skill questions might ask participants to rate their ability or proficiency in something. Again, these are just examples. For attitude questions, we could ask, how important is whatever, or what's your extent of agreement? And motivation questions could ask how likely the person is to do something, or the degree to which they're committed to do something. And so self-efficacy is really about confidence. So you would ask you know, the person to rate their confidence in doing something. And when investigating behavior change, you could ask about how often a person does something or engages in a specific activity. So these are just some examples of how to frame questions. So the most important thing with regard to focusing questions is to make sure they align with the purposes of the intervention and the purpose of the evaluation. So once you know what you want to measure, you need to determine the rating scale for your question or the continuum of possible responses. And the scale you use for any question is going to be really important. Of course, it needs to fit. It needs to make sense with the questions you're asking. And it has to fit with how you want to talk about your results on the other side of data collection after you've done analysis and you're writing, writing it up and trying to make sense of it. So a common way to set up retrospective pretest questions is to use Likert scales. And here's just a few examples. Um, they're often about agreement, but they can almost be, they can be about pretty much anything that's on a continuum. Here I also have examples of frequency and importance. Um, other examples might be like quality ratings, like from poor to excellent, level of awareness, skill level, likelihood to do something. Um, I've included a resource in our handout that has several examples of the different um, wording of different scales that I find really helpful. Likert scales are usually fully anchored, like this one. And that just means that every point on the scale has a descriptor or a label attached to it, like this. Another way to go um, with, is with partially anchored scales. And those provide descriptors for just some of the points on the scale. An attra attractive aspect of this type of scale is that you don't have to struggle with coming up with distinct dis labels for each point. But a drawback is that it gives the respondent more latitude for how to interpret those points. So there might be less consistency in how the person interprets, and any given individual, individual interprets the points on the scale and what those points represent. So a common mistake, oh, there's another one. I didn't mean to jump ahead. So this is a, a, another example of a partially anchored scale that you can see only the, the extreme ends are labeled. OK, so a, a problem I see in, in survey questions from time to time, and I, I really wish I would save the ones I come across that are, are really bad, because I can never find them again. I just made these up. But I have a few here I want you to take a look at. A um, common mistake is that there's misalignment between the question and the rating scale. So I have two examples here. So I'd like you to actually read the, these questions in their entirety, and then use the poll to indicate which of the questions, A or B, uh, you see a big problem. Maybe you see problems in both of them, but where's the bigger issue? Is it in A or is it in B? Okay, almost 100% of you are choosing A, so good for you. Yes, it is hard to make sense of this term usually in relation to agreement. So what does it mean to agree that you usually do something versus strongly agree that you usually do something? Do you do it more usually? So it doesn't make sense. And I know many of you have probably come across these items in, in being asked to do surveys. Um, but it's, it's pretty common to see these mismatches. I have another example for you. So go ahead and read this question. And then again, in the, if we could clear the last poll results out. Uh, Mike or Janet? This is a new one. The option should be C or D. Just one second, Lori. 
or give people time to read the question. I'm going to guess that you are going to find the problem, so I'm going to go ahead and go on. Um, there's a lot, there's too much going on in this question. So are we measuring ability or confidence, right? So the poor to excellence scale kind of works for rating ability, but not so much for confidence. So if we wanted to ask about confidence, if that's the important thing to know about, we should phrase the terms that, phrase the answer options with terms that match that, like with high to low confidence or not confident to very confident, something like that. Now, I, it's really nice to be able to use the same scale for multiple items, but a scale absolutely must work with every single question, or you're going to give yourself headaches when it comes time to analyze and report on these data. Yeah, I see now everyone was able to do the poll, and you all, almost everyone selected D. So the bottom line here is that you want to make sure your scale makes sense with your questions. And if they don't, you really can't be sure what you're actually measuring. So how do we format these questions? Well, I have to highly recommend the resources on the University of Wisconsin Extensions website, which we've included links on our handout. They have some really great resources on this method. Um, and the guidance I'm going to give in the next few slides comes from them. They uh, they say there's you know they they present three basic formats for way to to present these questions. So the first one looks like this, where the questions in the middle before the pre and the post answers. I mean, in the middle of the pre and the post answers, which are on either side. The second one looks like this, with the pre and post answer areas appearing one after another after the question. And the third has the pre and post options listed vertically rather than horizontally. But regardless of the format that you choose, there's some general guidelines to follow. And I'm going to go over those guidelines using this uh, example, uh, this example question. So first of all, it's best to have between four and seven points on your rating scale. With fewer, you're not going to be able to detect uh, the differences as well. And with more than seven, you run into trouble with people being able to make fine distinctions on the scale. I did come across one. Uh, it was actually a textbook that said, don't go higher than 11. So you know, you, use a scale that makes sense for you, but uh, for sure not more than 11. And gen tip usually probably don't want to go more than seven. You want to use formatting to clearly distinguish between the pre and the post items. And I've done that here by putting the now and before in caps above the response areas. And place the post item first. So we've already talked about this when we had a question break. But the idea is like to have the person start with their, where they are right now and then ask them to think back. And finally, you want to have clear instructions uh, to make sure respondents understand what they're being asked to do. I have to admit, I hate instructions. I almost never read them when it comes to surveys. So I do encourage you to set up your question as obviously as possible. But you do want to provide um, those instructions and make them clear, make the task clear. So I've got a special caution for web surveys. So if you're doing a survey online, you want to make sure you can actually format the questions the way that you want in the survey system that you're using. And go into the system first before you really commit to, uh, to a particular format. So we use Qualtrics for our online surveys. So I, I went into Qualtrics and put that same question in Qualtrics to see what the options would be. And I'll show you those examples. This one's pretty true to one of the formats I showed you earlier. And it's pretty efficient. So the actual question only has to be listed once. Um, here, rate your knowledge now and what it was before. Um, and it keeps the respondent focused on, on the, the topic. Uh, they answer before, or now, and before consecutively. So here's another option. It's a little bit less efficient because I have to repeat the rate your knowledge part uh, to set up the before and after questions vertically like this. And here's another option, but it's actually the, 
least efficient because it presents each item twice and makes the respondent shift back and forth between topics. But the point is to know what your options are and select the one that works best for you. So in case some of you have never actually experienced answering this kind of question, we're all going to do that now. So um, you're going to be able to use your marker tools in just a second. In the next slide, Mike will make those available to you. But I want to let you know how to do it. Um, you're going to see the marker tool here on the left. Uh, and then you select that. And then you can select the color and change the size if you want to. And then you'll be able to draw. So read this question and answer honestly. Uh, use your markers. We're not using a poll this time. So use your markers to mark those circles uh, as to which, which one best represents you. So we have almost 300 people trying to use their markers at once. Not a lot of people answering the question about before or what was their knowledge before this webinar on the life history of Anakin Skywalker. OK, we see it. We have people all over the map. So those of you. Uh, and reading up on Star Wars, I encourage you to do that after the webinar so you can increase your knowledge. But you get the idea here, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. It's always a good idea um, when you're just designing any kind of questionnaire, whether it's this, this using this method or not, always uh, do a pilot test or at least have it reviewed by people who are the kind of people who would be uh, filling it out. Um, somebody asked about children. For sure, if you're going to use it with children, you would want to make sure it actually works. So we have quite a diverse uh, range of knowledge here on both of these topics, I see. Oh, can we clear the marker? <laughs> lovely. No, one back. OK, so maybe Mike and Janet can clear the markers. Um, we're almost to the end. I'm trying to show you the. I think the markers are interfering with my advanced abilities. I'm trying to get to that. There we go. This is what I'm trying to show you, if you can see through that silliness, that we are almost to, gosh. OK, we need to take the marker tool away because I can't control my slides very well. But basically, we're almost uh, to the end of the second section. And we're going to hear from Goldie again. I hope Goldie is on the webinar and still on the phone. We didn't have any lose her due to technical problems. But after um, her comments, we'll have our question break. And then I'll come back to say a little bit about analysis and visualization of this type of data. I'm going to try to advance to our comment slide. There we go, Goldie. Thanks, Lori. Yes, you can um, relax. Mike uh, got me back in the webinar. So I want to just uh, make two comments for everybody to um, consider as we leave this section. We started early and we moved from the anatomy or architecture of this retrospective pretest method. And then we moved into section two, where we're talking about the nuts and bolts. And the real takeaway messages um, that cross-cut this section is, is twofold. One, you have to follow. You have to go back to basics, your training in survey design. And you have to go back and follow existing rules and guidelines for good survey items. This type of survey item is no different. And so there'll be resources for you to look at, but you have to keep that in mind. To, um, have this method work at the, with the quality and utility that the literature suggests, it relies on the fact that you're creating you know, well-done survey items. And you can, you know, obviously, there's a whole literature on that, and it's you know, fairly straightforward. The second thing um, that you'll see in some of the examples I'm going to show you in a few minutes is that if you are using learning objectives as part of your um, part of the survey item, you have to really be good at writing those objectives. So my background is not instructional design, but there is 
um, a nice literature and good information like Bloom's Taxonomy. And you can Google that and you'll see all these words and action words and levels of learning, levels of skill development. So if you are lear using learning objectives as part of your sur the survey item, what you're measuring against, you have to really make sure that those learning objectives are written appropriately and written specific to the kind of uh, changes you want to see. And so with those two comments, let me pass it to Miranda for our question section. Okay, thank you, Goldie. So we're at our um, next question break, and we have several questions that were asked in the box. Um, so the first one um, deals with when you're setting up the scales, is there a way to preference um, odd versus even number scaling? Um, and what does the literature say about that? Um, that is, that's a hot topic, right? Like if you search on that on a Val talk, there's all kinds of conversations around that. Um, it really, I actually don't like to have a middle um, option. So when I have an agreement scale, uh, for example, for this webinar, you're going to get everyone's going to be asked a question, a few questions, and the agreement scale is very simple: four points from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Because if really you sit here with us for 90 minutes, you how can you literally not agree or disagree at all that it was a good experience? Um, so I don't, for me, in the, especially in agreement scale, the middle category doesn't mean a lot. I think in a, a scale of um, competency, you know, like the, the, the middle point is really meaningful. I think for if you want to be able to group, you know, positive and negative, high gains and low gains, um, you, you, you don't want, you want to have an, have an uh, even number. But I, it's, that's my opinion. There's tons of literature on this, and I don't have a definitive answer. Again, I'll bet you there's people on this webinar who could, who could give people a, a, a direction to go in terms of terms of how to find out more. But there, um, anytime you go into looking up guidance for survey questions, you're going to come across this issue of odd or even. And think about on the other end. Like always think about it on the other end after analysis and reporting. What do you want to be able to communicate? Okay. So the second question is, is there a preference for whether the positive end of the scale should be on the left or the right side of the scale? Um, you know, I don't know what the authoritative answer on that. I, I always start. Uh, negative to positive. So if I was doing a, num a numbering scale from you know one to ten, of course I'm going to start with one, and I kind of just do it that way as well. In uh, if my scale is positive to negative, um, there may be other opinions out there. I will tell you that um, some people assume it's the other way. Like when you when we see our results of our our evaluation surveys, um, people will mark, they strongly disagree if this was not worth their while, and yet they give these glowing qualitative comments. So in those cases, you know they didn't really read the scale. So um, I don't have, I guess a long story short, I don't have a definitive answer on that. And I encourage other uh, audience members to chime in. OK, and then the last question is that um, what uh, survey platform might you suggest to use? I know you talked about Qualtrics earlier, but some folks were asking about the, um, the online platform that can accommodate these questions. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, I would bounce, turn that back and have that be a crowdsourced answer, because I know what I use, and that's Qualtrics. And I've dabbled in SurveyMonkey. Um, and I, what I showed you in Qualtrics is what I was able to do. I will tell you. Uh, I was updating the survey that everyone everyone said they're going to do at the end of this web on, webinar. And um, I made a, an executive decision when I was doing that. So we have a seven-point scale that we, what we're, going to sh we're going to show you in a little bit, a uh, seven-point scale I've been using. And I decided to lop off the seven, for at least for this webinar. We'll see how it works um, for two reasons. One, for being able to collapse data so I can collapse it in three nice levels if I have a, have a six-point scale. Um, and also because of the way the labels, I mean, quite practically, just the way the labels were lining up with the response options, because it is a partially anchored scale, which you'll see. This will make more sense when we show you the scale. So I think whatever system you're using, get in there and see what's possible. Um, I don't know that there's you know, one that is better for this than another. I don't have that answer. Okay. 
Well, great. Well, thank you very much for your answers. Um, I'd like to, to make sure that we move on to the next section. Um, so please, uh, to the participants, make sure you keep those questions coming in the chat box. And I will turn it back over to Lori, who will talk about analysis and visualization of the retrospective pretest data. OK, so this uh, part of the webinar, we're going to just go to some basic guidelines for analysis and visualization of this type of data. We're going to talk about analysis first. So it's basically how to take a set of raw data and transform it into something we can make meaning from. And the best place to start with ordinal data, which is usually what retrospective pretest data is, um, is with a simple frequency distribution of the ratings like this. So I made up some data uh, to show you what a comparison of percentages might look like. So first we have our actual rating categories as they appear on the instrument. Um, then we show how many people gave those ratings, both pre and post. Then we divide the number at each level by the total to get the percentages. So this is really basic stuff, right? But it does tell, we can see pretty quickly that most participants rated their knowledge, their pre-webinar knowledge is fair or good, and their post-webinar knowledge is good or excellent in this fabricated example. So this is a good place to start. Just to, we need to see what those numbers are. How are the answers distributed across, across the participants? Another thing to do would be to look at change scores. So we just calculate that by subtracting the individual's pretest score from their post-test score. Um, and here we see that 2% of the participants um, had no change. So zero change, 2% didn't change, 17% uh, went up one level on the scale, and so on. So it gives us a sense of the magnitude of the change. Another option is to calculate the means. Um, and means are very convenient for a quick check on the results and for seeing patterns. But you really want to be careful about interpreting the means of ordinal data. So you're going to lose uh, the details of the data, the nuances. And it's mathematically problematic because the points on an ordinal scale are not necessarily equally distant. So that means that we can't interpret a rating of excellent in this example as twice as good as fair, just because we've put those numbers with them. Um, we can't do that in the way that we can say $100,000 is twice as much as $50,000. But honestly, people do this all the time. They're going to average ordinal data all the time. So I don't want to pretend it's not going to happen. I just want to say do it with caution and don't start with the means. And you can really dig into these uh, types of data tables and get a lot of information out of it. But it's always nice to provide some visualization uh, to help with communicating results. And it can also help reveal patterns sometimes. So I'm going to show you some examples using real data. And these are from a recent workshop that we did. Um, and the workshop objectives are here. But basically, it was focused on the National Science Review Criteria, National Science Foundation Review Criteria of intellectual merit and broader impacts and how to gather and communicate evidence related to those criteria as people prepare to seek additional funding. And here was the rating scale. This is the scale I mentioned, the seven-point scale. And this was developed by Lori Stevan and Jean King uh, and others for evaluators to self-assess their competency in program evaluation. But you'll see the language isn't specific to program evaluation. Um, it's very adaptable to any, you know, any kind, measuring any competence in any area. So it's not without its flaws. I mentioned that issue uh, about six versus seven, getting into the e even an odd issue. Um, but it's, it's what we've used in the re our real world work. Um, and we're learning from it. Uh, and I, and I, I really appreciated that these folks had spent a lot of time developing the scale in these descriptors. So I had, I had uh, and do have trust in it and find it credible. Um, it is a partially anchored scale and has a quite a lot of description to clarify what each of the points, you know, what's, what those labels mean, what these terms of entry or novice, proficient or skilled, master or expert. And I originally used this in work I did this past year with Goldie. Um, and she's going to be talking about her use of it as well. So you, this is just background, right? So you've seen the objectives of the workshop. You've seen the scale. So now you can have a little more uh, understanding of the results. So in this example, we're looking at the results for one workshop, um, one of the workshop objectives. And the chart shows the percentage of people 
who rated themselves on each of the seven points on the scale, both before in dark gray and orange, uh, I'm sorry, and after in orange. We're going to break this down. Oh, I just want to point out, so anytime you're presenting percentage data, please remember to indicate your, the number of people responding. So here's our before data. And you can see here that most participants rated their competence before the workshop as a two or a three, so the high end of novice, so the lower end of proficiency. And after the workshop, or proficient, um, after the workshop, most participants rated their competence as four, five, or six. So we see it's a pretty noticeable, a visible shift here. And we can also easily identify by the me, the mode responses in this chart, which were two before the workshop and five after. So the workshop had four objectives, um, but it would be pretty overwhelming, I think, to present four of these charts in one, you know, all together and expect anyone to be able to compare them and make meaning out of it. But I did put two on the same chart. So here I'm comparing results from two different workshop objectives. And you can see, I think, that there wasn't as much progress with regard to objective three, and honestly, that didn't surprise me at all because that part of the workshop was really the least developed, and it really revolved around a conversation among participants um, we, rather than a much prepared lecture or structured activities. So this, to me, uh, again, sort of validated this kind of measure because it really resonated with my direct experience of, of the workshop, whereas on this other objective, you know, getting people to understand what intellectual merit and broader impact is from the perspective of the National Science Foundation, we see a more, more dramatic improvement. I also mentioned uh, change scores earlier. So here's one way to compare change scores across learning objectives. Um, the zero, I've, I've blocked out that first objective just to highlight the zero plus one plus two and so on. Those numbers refer to the number of levels on the rating scale that a participant gained. Um, so here we're tracking movement of individual participants rather than looking at things in aggregate. Um, of course, decreases are possible, but none of the data I, I've seen uh, shows any, any decrease in ratings from pre, pre to post. So what I noticed here was that two-thirds of the participants gained two or more levels on these objectives, objectives one and four. Um, but again, with that objective three, there wasn't uh, as much movement, uh, with more than a third of participants reporting no change at all, and 31% just going up one level. So I know if I want to keep this as an objective, and speaking to Goldie's point about you know how to frame objectives, this probably wasn't the best worded objective, I'll admit. Um, but if we're going to cover this content in the future, I know I have to do a better job in, in, uh, in delivering this information. So I really love these dot plots. So this one shows the mean before and after scores for all the objectives. And even though we're breaking the rules here with uh, averaging our ordinal data, this chart tells pretty much the same story that we've seen in, in the other ways, in the other visualizations. Um, but it may not always work out like that. We, we have a, a fairly uh, kind of not exactly a normal distribution, but we didn't have a situation where a lot of people were coming in really as in at the low end of the scale and a lot of people at the high end. So it was more evenly distributed. And that's probably why our means kind of tell the same story as the other uh, ways of looking at these data. So I'm curious which, you, uh, which of these you found to be the most effective means of communicating these results visually. So if you want to use the, your poll to cast your vote, uh, do that now. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, close between the column charts with percentages and the dot plots with means. The bar charts is not, uh, I mislabeled that. It shouldn't be bar charts with means. It should be bar charts with chain scores. Sorry about that, but I think you get the idea. Um, but that's a lot of information to take in. There is four objectives represented here. Um, in the column charts with percentages, we only have two. So maybe it's unfair to compare those. But I, I would say I have to agree with you. And I think if you do use means or if you have continuous uh, data, uh, ratio data, that the dot plots are just super cool. So thank you for doing the poll. 
um, we're, that was a short section. We're almost at the end of uh, the third section of the webinar. And we're going to have a question break now, and then I'm going to talk about the design. Now, is that what I'm talking about? No, we're talking about using results uh, from this type of data. So I'm going to turn it over to Miranda. OK, thanks, Lori. So we had a number of other questions um, that were asked during the section. So one of the first questions was, how do you deal with negative change, where the score is lower on the post-test part than on the pre-test part? Um, well, I'll just admit I have no idea because I haven't gotten any data like that, and I didn't um, I didn't read about not that I read every single word on this, but I didn't come across anything like that. But um, it's hard to imagine being able to like. Could you imagine coming in at least in this? Let's think of our webinar coming into our webinar and rating yourself as having like. At the end of this webinar, you rate yourself as having, let's say, uh, you know, let's say adequate knowledge. I can't imagine. I can't make sense of saying, but before, I don't. I can't even. I can't even say it because I'm having trouble. So, I'm just going to say I don't know. So, if others know, I would encourage them to write in the chat box how to deal with uh, a decrease. You know, where it might come in is if you're talking about frequency of doing something. Like if you had an intervention that spanned a period of time and you wanted people to change some practice, something they're doing, um, and then you have them answer about their behavior pre and post, I think then you could see uh, a negative change. So that's a really interesting question. You would, I can imagine one of those um, like bar charts that have the zero in the middle. And I can imagine what I'm talking about. So you have some, uh, some lines some columns going above the line and some going down. So you could you can still calculate your change scores, it's just that some of them would be negative. And I could I could see being able to do a bar chart where you have some things negative values and some positive. So sorry it took me a while to come around to that, but I think that is po definitely possible with um, if you're talking about doing you know a frequency or a quantity of something. The next question, and you may not be able to answer this in a short uh, time, but. Do you have any um, knowledge about how to calculate change scores in Qualtrics? Um, um, I don't know anything about calculating anything in Qualtrics, because when I use Qualtrics for data, I always put it in SPSS or Excel. Um, but there is, a, there is another way of doing this kind of, it's different than retrospective pre-post. I think it's called perceived change. So instead of asking the individual to say, OK, what was your rating? What's your, what's your level now? What's, what was your level before? Instead of asking those two separate things, you ask one thing. So you ask them, you know, compared with the, you know, your knowledge level before this webinar, how much has it changed or decreased as a result of this webinar? So they give one value. And you could definitely set a question like a, that in Qualtrics or any other um, software. But I don't personally do any analysis in Qualtrics itself, so I don't, can't speak to that. OK. Um, the next question would be, um, how, how do you handle cases where people report being at the highest level of knowledge on the pre-task, uh, and therefore there's little room for change? So there was some discussion going on in the chat box, but perhaps we can hear your comment on that. Well, I think that um, there could be several things going on. One, it could be, let's just use the example of using uh, interventions objectives, which, which is what I've done and what Goldie's done for certainly the no, by no means the only way to do this, but let's think about that. Um, so one issue is you haven't written your objectives well. You wrote them too low. And whether, I don't know, you know, maybe the content was delivered too low as well. So it might not be well targeted, either in terms of the actual objectives or the way they were worded. The other possibility, which, I, which is why I think it's always good to look at, like, are you reaching your intended audience, is did you have the right people in the room or you know, in, in the webinar? Is it the people who needed the content? If they're already all experts, um, the, 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 the intervention wasn't marketed appropriately to reach the target audience. So that's something as well. But in, in, my next sec, in our next section, I actually have an example where we'll see some of that. So I won't say much more about that right now. OK, and then one last question. Um, love the dot plot. Why is it not valid again? Or is it possible that it's not valid? Or under what circumstances might that not be a valid way to present the data? Well, I don't think it's a chart, whether a chart is valid or not. I think it's whether is it is the mean the appropriate way to represent your, your results. And when you have, for sure, when you have nominal data, um, 
you know, it's it's nonsense. You can't do it. Um, when you have ordinal data, it's it's problematic. So a poor to excellent scale is nominal. Um, I mean, sorry, ordinal. It's ordinal. So there's a it, there's a problem in trying to average those those concepts. Just because we put numbers on them doesn't make make it more legitimate. But if you don't put numbers on your scale, definitely don't average them. Because if you're going to average those, I mean, the, at least the respondent needs to know you are perceiving these things as one point apart. Um, so again, I would just reiterate my point. Like, don't start with the means. Make sure you're looking at your frequency distributions. Um, look at your chain scores. If the means represent your data well, I think it's OK. I think it's a convenient way to, to show results. It's quite efficient, and the dot plots are, are really cool. Um, but make sure the means are telling the right story, and that you haven't violated some you know, statistical law in doing it. And that you, you're just informed, that you're making an informed choice about your, your analysis and your presentation of results. OK. Well, thank you, Lori. And uh, we're going to move on to our final section which is about using the results from the retrospective pretest. So just briefly, I want to point out, Goldie, I'm going to say a little bit, and then Goldie's going to come on. And in this section, we're really speaking more from the perspective of trainers, more so than evaluators. So we're both evaluators, but we both provide evaluation training. And it's our use of results in that context that we're highlighting today. And I'm going to show mine pretty quickly, because I want to make sure we have here, here from Goldie. So this is what uh, somebody was just talking about. Like if somebody comes in quite high, so uh, you know, at a level 6, they don't, they don't have much more far to go. And that's definitely possible. So what I've done here is I have um, grouped people according to their incoming level. So 17% of the people rated themselves a 1 before the workshop, and their mean score um, at the end for that group was a 3.9. So, and you can see 21% who came in as a 3, that group ended at a 4.7. So there's no su big surprise in this pattern. So the more people had to learn, the more they learned, the less room for growth, the less growth they had. No big surprise. But for me, this is meaningful. So I, it tells me that we're serving this novice group pretty well, and we need to continue doing that. But this middle group um, could benefit from some more advanced content or possibly some tailored mentoring or coaching if we could figure out resources to do that. But this advanced group, and it's just 14%, but we're probably not going to be able to do much to directly improve their knowledge and ability. But maybe we can aid in their professional development by tapping their expertise to help the rest of this group and of our audience. So in using this method, um, in this way of looking at the results, I know a lot more about where people you know, came in and where they left. Um, and and I, we can tailor our content accor you know, accordingly. And, and again, it's speaking again to that issue of marketing, uh, t uh, targeting the right audience. I think this is helpful. So we've had an item on our, all of our training feedback surveys for many years that just asked the respondents to react to the statement of this webinar or you know, its workshop, whatever. Increase my knowledge of evaluation. And it's a four-point scale ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And here are the results which is from the last webinar we did, and it's just pretty typical. Um, but it leaves us wondering, what did they learn and how much? So now that we're using this retrospective pretest method, we get much richer information. So that webinar we did back in August, it had two objectives. And we asked respondents to rate their competence related to each of them using that same seven-point scale. Um, and here are the results for the first objective. And we can see a clear shift um, from fo folks clustered in the middle uh, range to moving further along uh, as in the post ratings that you see in purple. But for the second objective, um, the participants started higher. So you can see they're more spread out across the scale in the dark gray. And they gained less. Um, so we know next time we offer this webinar, we need to try you know, a different strategy to communicate this content better, give them something at a higher level. And I was looking at this and thought, well, where do I want us to be? And I didn't do this mathematically, but I just drew these red boxes here. Like, this is where I want to see these the next time uh, we do this. Or you know, maybe we need to change our objectives and, and try to hit a different uh, content area. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Goldie, and she's going to tell us about her use of this type of data as a trainer. Holy. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. So I wanted to share with everyone 
the questions that I was really thinking about in terms of this presentation. They're on the screen now, and it's really, why is this use of these retrospective pretest items so informative for evaluation of training for me as an instructor? So many of us at CDC and certainly in all the organizations I saw on the registration list, many, many people are providing training. And these data provide some specific value added that are helpful for me as an instructor. I also want to show you those. I want you to see what they look like. And then I want you to see how I took those and translated those into action for one of the evaluation courses I teach. So let's look at that. Um, the first example, well, the example of the case we're going to look at is a course on development and use of indicators for program evaluation. So uh, a big portion of my position at CDC and the Center for Global Health is teaching. I teach domestically and internationally. And one of my favorite courses, it's a newer course, is development and use of indicators. So I taught this course for the first time in this format at the American Evaluation Association Summer Institute in Atlanta in June, just not that long, well, kind of a little while ago. But um, I want you to look at their evaluation items for this course. And these are really common items used to evaluate training. Nothing surprising here, and it's not, har not horrible, but I want you to see the question that speaks to what we're talking about on this call, which is these changes in learner outcomes, whether they're knowledge, skill, motivation, et cetera. And the question that they use, and many, many, many organizations use, is something like this. So you see there's an overall institute average, and then there's the, the value for my workshop. And when I get this from AEA, I'm really left, you know, I'm left very pleased that there was a you know, there was growth and performance, but I don't have substantive information to improve the workshop or, importantly, to make changes as I'm moving forward with other workshops. So for that course at the Summer Institute, the AEA Summer Institute, I did a supplemental evaluation where I introduced the retrospective pretest items. And I'm looking specifically at changes in knowledge or skills according to the learning objectives. You can see the learning objectives in the middle. And again, I, like Lori, really appreciate the scale um, from Jean King. The reference was on the earlier slide. I have a lot of faith in it. And importantly, my stakeholders, both um, in Atlanta, but also in our field offices, really value that added detail under the scale, so the operationalization of those levels of performance. So let's look at this, how this turned out. So this is the Atlanta event in June. There's our scale that we're using. And there it is in more detail. You see that it's the same one Lori showed you. And here are the results from the June workshop in AEA. So the feedback on the evaluation form for AEA was just was their growth. With the retrospective pretest item, I can see, according to each objective, the level of change, the amount of change by learning objectives. See the learning objectives on the bottom, we're using the scale, and pre and post with light and dark blue. I was just going to say, so is everyone with me, but you can't respond back. Um, so I'm just going to respond for you. Yes, we're with you. So I want you to look at this now in relation to that scale. So what we saw is that roughly we had people entering the workshop at a level two, this kind of entry or novice level. And we are seeing people leave the workshop with some skills, some basic capabilities. So as I was thinking about this, and that's an important point, that descriptor, the notion that people leave this workshop in June with some basic capabilities. As I was thinking about this, I'm preparing for the next offering of this workshop, and it would be in, uh, in Atlanta also, but at our headquarters, and it would be for CDC personnel. And for the first time in using this method, 
I really started to think about what do I want for those participants? And I started looking around and looking at the literature on how you improve proficiency. Like what is the, what is the current thinking? What, what do instructional designers say about how you push harder on proficiency? And I'm an evaluator by training. I'm not an instructional designer. But what I came to learn was a lot about classroom response systems or clickers. And some of you that are in education probably have a lot more knowledge of clickers uh, than I had. It actually was new to me. So the things that came to mind when I thought about the data were I really needed to push to involve every learner in exercises and these knowledge checks for sure. So in, a, in the AEA event at the Summer Institute, you know, you, there is participation and there is involvement, but the extent of that, I, I couldn't know, really. And participation was a critical way that proficiency would be pushed. I also needed to enhance collaboration. I wanted to use, these data suggested that the small group exercises were good, but with some of the qualitative comments that it really wasn't enough participation. I needed to also find a way to sustain engagement through complex technical content and also, I, something I didn't have previously was more real-time feedback. So taking this kind of out of this notion that I'm all, only getting basic capabilities that first time around, I realized that I wanted to push for higher, push for a higher level of achievement. So the data-driven decisions based on that thinking I showed you in the previous slide, I added the use of clickers. I scaled back the content to look more deeply at those core topics that I knew to be most critical in my own organization. So the constant in the AEA event and the CDC event was time. I could not change the length of the workshop. So I had to make other decisions based on the data to drive improvement in this workshop. So let's look at that. You see here, in this slide, the learning objectives are reduced down to four. So same amount of time in the workshop, but we're diving deeper into some of the core content that would be meaningful in my own organization. We're also, for the first time, I really stopped to think about what level do I want them at? What level am I trying to get our field personnel or our uh, headquarters personnel to function, like a functional level. And you know, the fact is, it's really not four. It actually is a five or better. They need to be applying this knowledge effectively, not just basically. They really need to be able to do it, uh, you know, and with some regularity. So you see now that I'm trying to push the learners above five. And that was the first time I've really um, thought about that or pushed that before, and this is a really, I think, a common thing that happens with this method, before you're thinking, I just want change. I just want improvement. But the more you do that, use this method, the more you start to think, well, really, if I have this great scale that I believe in, what kind of change do I want and how much? The other piece, when you look at this scale is something that Lori just talked about, and we're not going to go into too much more detail on it, but it's regardless of where participants begin on the scale, I still need to get them to a certain level to function effectively or efficiently in the field. And so previously, I had been thinking, I just want them to move from somewhere to somewhere. And that's not actually what, what the theory of change behind my training is. I really need them to get to a certain place. So there were all these things that um, came to light. And when you look at the two places where I really emphasized, um, again, based on my knowledge of CDC and, the pers and our personnel, regardless of their starting points being a little bit higher than the AEA course, we still did see a higher increase, a bigger jump to get to those five on the scale. So um, I, feel, I feel really good about some of what's come out of 
this shift in how I'm teaching this course. I mean, I think there's obviously still room for growth. The other big message here is I had to take those data, the data from the retrospective pretest items, I had to combine them with some of the qualitative information from the evaluation form and my own experience in the workshop, that sense of feeling uh, that I had when people were not tracking with the content. You know, as an instructor, you know, you're kind of triangulating those data to come to some of the decisions I showed you here. But I would not have come to them without including the use of this retrospective pretest. And so with that, I want to go back to Lori and Miranda for a question break. Um, and I'll stop there. OK. Well, thank you, Goldie. So we've reached our final question break. And there were several questions that were entered into the chat box. So first, uh, the first question is for Goldie. And it says, um, did you want or need to analyze individuals for their change scores at all? So, so that's a really, really good question. And I want to give you just a practical answer, which is, with the amount of teaching I'm doing, um, I have to be really clear on what the aim is. And my key stakeholders, what they want uh, when I'm instructing. So the answer to that is largely no. But I know that different groups, depending on where I'm teaching, um, have different levels of achievement. But my point in that last section was the take-home message for me is I need to move people to funct a functional level. And so some people, like Lori showed you, some people are having much greater change, and some people are having a little less. But our aim as an organization for these workshops is to get people to a functional level. That five, I really, really like that five. And if we have a bunch of experts, more power to them. But for me, the, the mandate and kind of desire is to move the group, the collective, to the five-ish. Well, thank you. The second question is, could you briefly um, just talk more about the use of the clickers? Uh, yeah, so I am giving away the fact that I'm clearly not an instructional designer. And I was doing a tremendous amount of research on how to improve the outcomes of these trainings. Because the fact of the matter is, and Lori and I talked about this yesterday, I've been teaching some of this content more than a decade. They're good courses. But if I'm going to continue to do it for another decade, <laughs> I'd like to make them better. And so as I looked at the literature, the clickers are a way with adult learners, I mean, not only adult learners, but I focused on adult learners, to make sure that you have engagement in the whole room. So when I'm using the clickers, I know how many clickers I've given out, and I'm waiting for every clicker to respond. So that's kind of critically important for me when I work in different parts of the world because participation patterns can be very different. Um, and so for me, the clickers um, provide this thing where qu people can quietly really let me know, let each other know, engage with each other, and engage with me as we move through those learning objectives. So it's a lot of work to set them up, and I'm happy to talk with anybody offline about that. Um, but I had a lot of support from um, the company, uh, the software company that I use. So anyways, yeah, it's been really interesting and uh, I, think, uh, I think a substantial addition to the workshops. OK, thank you. So we have time to answer one more question. And that was directed um, to Lori. And the question was about the uh, mastery and expert scale. Um, and they said, well, there's more variability. There's a wider range in the mastery level. There were three points instead of two. Does that introduce bias when analyzing the results? And then why not have it be a six-point scale so there's an even, an equal number of categories? Yeah, and I really appreciate that question. I saw it came from Wendy and maybe some others chimed in on that. And I will say that I landed in the exact same spot. So we, we used this. We, we, Goldie and I looked all over for good scales to use for this. And we landed on the one by Stevon and King because it was really rich. Um, and we trusted them. And uh, we adopted it 
Now, when, I'm, when I've dug into the data using the scale, I realize it is a problem. It is a problem that there's three on the, at the mastery, that there's five, six, seven at the mastery level. It also makes it difficult to combine the data. So when everyone on this, like I said, everyone on this webinar is going to do our, our evaluation survey at the end, and they're going to see a six-point scale. Because for my uses, I've decided to, to make that change. What I think happened, what, the difference is, different purposes in the scale. So the scale was originally developed so people could self-assess. Like, I'm one person, and I want to assess where I am in my program evaluation competence so I can figure out you know, what else I should be learning. I don't think it was intended to gather data from a lot amount of people and be able to analyze it. So those points are definitely, those points are valid for sure. But what we're showing you is like the the way things I think happen in the real world, and we're not, you know, spiffing this up for for showcases. This is what we really use. I think it really worked for Goldie. I think I don't think there's been major issues. Like the way we're using this data is to see where people are and how we can improve. We are not using it to say absolutely people are, you know, they're, they're mass, they've reached the mastery level. We aren't using it that way, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't use it that way. So those are those very. I just want to say those are good points, um, and I kind of landed in the same place the more I was working with this data and reading on things in preparation for this webinar. I also wanted to say I, I heard the links in the handout aren't working, and I, you know, maybe when we PDF'd it and we didn't check it, something happened. I will fix that right away, and it'll be up within half an hour at the end of the webinar, and you'll be able to get all those resources. So I apologize for that, but we will fix it quickly. Okay. Well, thanks, Lori. Um, so we. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you very much for the, all the questions. And so now we've reached the end of our time together. Um, as we mentioned throughout the webinar, we'd like you to take the opportunity or take the time to um, take our end of webinar survey. The link is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, and if you click on December 9 webinar survey, it, you'll get the opportunity to go to the link. It'll appear in the Browse to window uh, right below. And you can just click on that, and it will, or click on Browse too, and it will take you to the survey. Um, while you are taking the survey, I would like to take the opportunity to thank both uh, Lori Wingate and Goldie McDonald for being our presenters today. I would like to thank all the folks at Maytech for uh, helping us make sure the webinar ran smoothly. I would, lastly, I would like to thank the audience uh, for all the great questions and participation today. And with that, we'll sign off, um, and we'll leave the survey open for a little while until uh, you can fill it out. All right, uh, take care, everybody.